Explorer. We're looking at the Explorer Derivatives Worksheets. So uh, we did, if you watched the video, we did one, two, and three together on there. So let me first read off the answers that we should have gotten for number four and number five. And we'll talk a little bit about the significance of that. And then we'll flip over the page and talk to them about the really kind of interesting stuff there. So. What were we supposed to do yesterday? Because this is what I did yesterday. Yeah. And there's a homework assignment out of the book, too. Oh, okay. So this we did. In, in normal years, we would have done this homework assignment out of the book. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you may or may not have matched their answers because they said approximate the derivative using f of x plus h minus f of x over h, and you had to pick some number for h. Well, the sum number that uh, our calculator uses, I think it's 1,000, 1, 1,000, or it might be 1, 10,000, just one of those two. And so it, it can't take the whole, it can't do the whole limit thing. So it just plugs these numbers in and kicks you back an approximation, which surprisingly enough, most of the time is accurate to within three decimal places, which is what we need. But on this case where the derivative doesn't exist, what we're seeing, because it's telling us this is 0 0.001, so that means that when you come 1, 1,000 to the right, this is just a little bit bigger than it was on the left, which is why it's a positive, but a small positive number. But that is not correct, because the correct answer is the derivative doesn't exist there. Now, in a similar fashion on part D, where you have y equals x over x squared minus x, uh, if you factor that denominator, you can see that at zero, we're going to get a hole in the graph. But at one, we're going to get a vertical asymptote, right? Because you got an x minus one in the denominator that doesn't cancel with anything in the numerator. You with me? Vertical asymptote at x equals one. Well, so when you find the derivative at x equals negative two, that's fine. Because that's nowhere near any of these discontinuities. So that is correct. But when you try to do it in part D, where it's at x equals 1, that's right where this thing is not even defined. That's right at a vertical asymptote. So what's happening is, you know, this thing is doing something like that at that vertical asymptote. But remember, what our calculator is doing is it's not trying to evaluate it right at x equals 1. That would be impossible. But it's going to pick something a little bit to the right of 1 and just a little bit to the left of 1. So when you go a little bit to the right, you're going to get a really big positive number. When you take something a little bit to the left, you're going to get a really big negative number. And then when you subtract those and divide, then that's why you're getting 1 million. Because it's finding the slope of this line between those two points and saying, ah, it's close enough to the tangent line. And in fact, it's not right at all because the derivative does not exist there. The function doesn't exist there. It's a discontinuity. And similarly, on, number, on part f, where on f you have this y equals x minus 2 to the 2 thirds power, uh, x minus 3 rather, to the 2 thirds, and we're trying to find the derivative at x equals 3. But what's happening at 3 is you're getting a cusp. So when you have this even over odd power, that's going to be a cusp. And so again, the derivative doesn't exist there. That's one of those four places where the derivative doesn't exist. But the calculator is going to take a point a little bit to the right and another point a little bit to the left. Because of the symmetry, those are the same y values. So when you go to subtract them, it's going to be 0. And that's why it's telling you that the derivative is 0. That is not correct because the derivative doesn't exist there. So the takeaway from this, what we're going to get at the very end, is that you have to know the four places that a derivative can fail to exist recognize that in a function and don't try to put that onto your calculator and ask your calculator to find the numerical derivative at a place where you know the derivative won't exist, right? A discontinuity, a corner point, a uh, vertical tangent, and a cusp. Because it may very well give you a, a, an answer that looks perfectly okay, but it's actually wrong. So let's talk about that. Uh, turn the page to number six there on the back side. It was asking you to use the definition of the derivative to find what that derivative actually is and see that, therefore, the answer that our calculator gave us is really wrong. So let's pause a moment. Do you understand what it's asking you to do here? To use our definition of a derivative and that we have a piecewise function. Since we're trying to find the derivative at 2, we want to take a right-hand derivative and a left-hand derivative. Okay, now there's a couple ways you can do it. I think on the, I'm not sure on the, if you watch the supplemental video, I think I did it using f of x minus f of c over x minus, or f of x minus f of c over x minus c. I'll do this the other way here so you can see a, a alternative version of that. So we're trying to uh, find f prime of 2 is what our goal is. 
And because we have a piecewise function, and it's defined differently to the right of two than it is to the left of two, we're gonna to have to find the left-hand derivative and the right-hand derivative and see if they're equal to each other. If they are, the derivative exists, so that's what it is, but we're gonna find out they're actually different, okay? So if we do it on the right, so for x greater than or equal to two, our piecewise function says we have x squared minus three x plus two. You with me here? So I'm gonna, this is now gonna be what I'm gonna call a right-hand derivative. And we can use this formula maybe that we're gonna have a little bit more comfort with. So I'm gonna say the limit as h goes to zero, and I'm doing the right-hand definition, the definition of the function for values of x that are bigger than two. That's what makes this the right-hand derivative. And I'm gonna do the f of a, f of two plus h minus f of two all over h. Understand what I'm doing here? Evan, we okay? Amanda? Yeah. Okay, so this is gonna be now the limit as h goes to zero. F of two plus h is gonna be this two plus h squared minus three times two plus h plus two. And then minus, and now I'm gonna take the derivative at two, or an f of two rather. So that's gonna be two squared minus three times two plus two. And that is all over h. So I'm going to take the limit as h goes to 0. Now, multiplying out that 2 plus h, we're going to get the first one squared 4. Twice the product is 4h. If I start going too fast, just holler and I'll slow down. Plus the second one squared is going to be an h squared. Distributing the negative 3 over the 2 plus h is going to make that a negative 6 minus 3h, and we have that plus 2. I'm just going to do the arithmetic inside the parentheses there. That's 2 squared is 4 minus 6 plus 2. So that turns out, I think, just to be 0. Does that look right? That's going to be just 0, so I'm going to drop it off altogether, and that's over h. Now, if we did this right, we should get everything that it does not have an h in it to cancel. Let's see, we have a 4, a minus 6, and a plus 2. 4 minus 6 and plus 2 is indeed 0. Everything else has an h in it. So I'm going to go limit as h goes to 0. I think we can combine the 4h and the negative 3h to make that h plus h squared all over h. So I'm almost there. Limit as h goes to 0. Factoring out the h in the numerator and canceling it with the denominator, means we are going to take the limit as h goes to zero of one plus h. You direct substitute in zero for the h, and what we get is one. So our right-hand derivative is one. That is, remember, we said this is gonna really be, this is our absolute value. So what we're really seeing is something that's doing that, and so our derivative, when we come in from the right side, is a positive one. So now I'm going to do the left-hand derivative. So left-hand derivative. So we're going to take the limit as h goes to zero. Now I'm going to look up at the piecewise function, and for it says in the piecewise function that for x less than two, that our function is going to look like negative of x squared minus three x plus two. So the negative of what we just did there because to the left of 2, then what we're going to get in here is going to be a negative value, and the absolute value is going to multiply by negative 1 in order to make it positive. That's that kind of flipping over the uh, x-axis that we talked about is taking place there. So here we go. We're going to get, um, again, we're going to take f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 uh, all over h, but what's making it the left-hand derivative is what we're going to use for f is this definition for uh, f for the absolute value that comes from the negative side, that negative quantity there. So I'm going to get negative parentheses 2 plus h squared minus 3 times 2 plus h plus 2 in parentheses where the negative is going to distribute over all that. You with me there? Now go ahead, okay, and then minus the 
the f of 2, which is going to have a negative, and then I got parentheses, 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2, all over h. And I'm going to squeeze in that limit as h goes to 0. Okay, so that's going to be a negative, and then we're going to square out the 2 plus h. First one squared is 4, twice the product is 4h, second one squared is h squared. Everybody with me here? Okay. And then I'm going to, let's see, distribute that negative. So uh, let me put that negative outside everything there. So that's going to be uh, negative 3 times 2 is a negative 6 uh, minus 3h. And we have the plus 2. And then in that bracket, and everything's going to get multiplied by that negative 1 way out in front. And then here I'm going to do that same story. That's going to be a plus. But we can see that's going to still be 0 like it was before. 2 squared is 4 minus 6 plus 2 is still going to be 0. And that's still all over h. And we're still taking that limit as h goes to 0. Getting there. All right. Let's go ahead and distribute. Well, let's see. I'm going to take away this parentheses. I don't need that. Okay. So now we're going to let the stuff inside the brackets kill each other off. So the 4, the negative 6, and the 2 are all going to kill each other. We've got 4h, and a minus 3h is our h plus h squared. So I have the negative h plus h squared all over h. Still taking that limit as h goes to 0. So we can factor our h out. So now it's a negative h times 1 plus h all over h. The h is canceled. Now it's safe to uh, substitute in 0 for the remaining h. And so we get 1 in the parentheses, but that negative outside is going to make that left-hand limit, that left-hand derivative, negative 1. So by doing all of this, we have now made a convincing argument that the derivative on the right is positive 1, the derivative on the left is negative 1. Therefore, that is going to be what we call a what? We have a finite derivative on one side and a different finite derivative on the other side. That is known as a corner point. And we know the derivative at a corner point doesn't exist. Okay. So f prime of 2 does not exist. And yet, we found that our calculator says that derivative was 0 0.001. Bad day for those that believe that a calculator is the source of all truth in this world. No? So, a takeaway then, again, just to reiterate, is we have to recognize when a derivative doesn't exist. When is it going to be discontinuous, a corner point, a cusp, and a vertical tangent, so that we don't inadvertently try to plug that into our calculator and find that numerical derivative on our calculator. And you will have to do numerical derivatives on your calculator on the AP exam as a certainty. It's one of those must-have skills. So but you have to know when to do that and when not to. So in number seven, then, it says, notice your calculator's answers, and we talked about that on E and F. And so we see that the actual uh, derivatives don't exist at that point. So we just have to be on alert. That's the takeaway. Then it said in number eight, to consider the function y equals x to the n, where n is an irrational number. So we're trying to know, so how are we going to recognize that there are some, some clues to when a function is going to have uh, a discontinuity, uh, a vertical tangent, a cusp, a corner point. So uh, one of those in part A, it says, if n is a positive integer, Will the graph of y equals f of x, f of x have any corners, cusps, vertical tangents, or discontinuities? No. So those are our safe functions, right? Any polynomial is continuous and differentiable everywhere. So those are safe functions. We know what's happening there. With rational functions, polynomial over polynomial, the only places we have to worry where it will not be continuous and therefore not differentiable is going to be where? 
Say it again. Holes and vertical asymptotes, which is where the denominator is zero. So if, if your denominator is zero, that's going to be an issue. It's not going to be continuous. It's not going to be differential. Okay? So going on, part B, for what values of n will we get a cusp? Do we know? So this is now B. So yeah. So anytime you have an even over an odd, and where this are, uh, so if I say this is x to the p over q, where the p over q is between 0 and 1. So if, if we get bigger than 1, there's no problem. So if we have, say, x to the um, 6 fifths, this is not going to be a problem with the derivative because this is bigger than 1. So when we do our power rule and we get 6 fifths and we subtract 1 from that 6 fifths, we're going to get something that isn't going to be 0 in the denominator. And so it doesn't have any issues. So there's no problems there. But if we see something like maybe x is equal to 4 fifths, now when we differentiate that and subtract 1 from the 4 fifths, we're going to get a negative 1 fifth. It's that negative 1 fifth that is the source of our problem, right? Because that negative 1 fifth is over the fifth root of x to the fourth. So now when x is 0, this is totally undefined. As we approach 0 from either side, as we come in from the negative side, these will be very small negative numbers, which when you take a positive divided by a very, very small negative number, is going to get to be a very large negative. And so the tangent lines are going to have slopes that drop off to negative infinity. When you come in from the positive side, put in a very small positive number, the fifth root of a positive number is still positive, a positive not zero over a very, very, very small positive number is going to be a very, very large positive number, which is why when you come in from the right, that's going to go to positive infinity. So that's why we get the cusp out of the x to the even over odd power, as long as that whole exponent is between zero and one. Once we get bigger than one, we're out of the danger zone. There's no issues with derivatives there. So part C, it says, how can we tell when there's a vertical tangent? Miranda, who watched the video, what is that? <laughs> um, like the cube root of x. Yeah, and what about the cube root of x is our clue. What do you notice? So our, what I, I, the way I try to remember, I don't know if this helps, is I try to think of an example. So, you know, we're just adding to these different kinds of functions that we have seen a lot of. You know, we have seen, you know, y equals 1 over x. We've seen the volcano graph, one, y equals 1 over x squared. We've seen this weird absolute value, x over x, where you get the big jump discontinuity. So the more of these we can add to our repertoire, then I think the we're way ahead of the game in terms of understanding what's going on. So x to the 2 thirds is our exemplar for our cusp. x to the 2 thirds has a cusp at x equals 0. What about that? Well, if you remember this, you say, oh, it's even over odd. So any even over odd, 4 over 7, you know, 8 over 19, that's going to be a cusp. So an even over odd with the, with the less than 1 is going to give us a cusp. For vertical tangent, our exemplar is the cube root of x, which is x to the odd over odd power. And so what makes it a vertical tangent is that you have this odd over odd, but again, the whole thing is between 0 and 1. Because once we get bigger than 0, then we're out of the danger zone. And we're not going to get a derivative that's going to do something really wacko. But when we are between 0 and 1, it's going to behave very strangely, or not strangely, but in a way that where the derivative won't exist. You can see that because if you have this derivative, I mean, so there's the visual of what this y equals the cube root of x looks like, that you're going to get this vertical tangent right there. That's the visual understanding. The algebraic understanding is when you take this derivative and you do your power rule, that negative exponent is going to cause the problem. So the 3 from the 1 third is just a constant. 
the two thirds is going to be the cube root of x squared. So now, like we saw with our uh, with our cusp, as you approach zero, this is going to get very small, but the numerator is not. The difference from the cusp is because of this squaring, when you put in a small negative or a small positive, it squares it and makes it positive. So it becomes the same sign. So you get a positive over a very small positive coming in from both sides. So this is going to go to the same infinity. So as you approach there, it's going to uh, a vertical tangent. So as you look here and you look at those tangents, they're getting steeper, steeper, really big positive until it goes straight vertical, which we think of as being a slope of positive infinity. When you come in from the other side, we're still positive. Bigger, positive, bigger, 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 and it goes to straight vertical, which we think of as positive infinity. So the derivative on both sides, the slope of the tangent lines on, the, on both sides go to the same infinity. That's what happens with a vertical tangent. And you know, you can recognize it's going to be a vertical tangent because it's going to be x to the odd over i. And for restricted domain, this isn't as big a deal. And I think we have more familiarity anyway. You know, our classic example for a restricted domain is going to be our square root function, but it's not defined for negatives. So when you graph the square root, it's going to only exist over there for x greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So when why does it happen? It's because that denominator is zero. I mean, sorry, the denominator is even. So what you get for a restricted domain is going to be odd over even. And here, it doesn't matter if it is bigger than one or not. So even if that's like five halves, you're still going to, you know, if, even if this was x to the five halves, then we're going to still have this issue that is denominated this derivative. So I'm going to say d dx. So it's going to be five halves x to the three halves. Well, x to the three halves still has a square root in it. And so it's still not going to be defined for a negative value. So it's still going to have a restricted domain. Okay, so the big takeaways, I mean, the restricted domain is nice, and I think that's, that's valuable, but the real ones you got to know and recognize are the cusp and the vertical tangent. Because if you don't know and you're not on the alert for it, then you can get yourself in trouble trying to use your calculator to find that derivative. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about derivatives and what I want to be able to do with the worksheets that you have in front of you there. So, so there are key features. It's like, I mean, when you start out, this is really, really hard. And even as we get better, it's, it's never, I don't think, going to be easy. But we, and we just keep adding more complications to it. But we want to train our eye and our brain to recognize key features about uh, the graph of a function that give us important information about the graph of the derivative. So we want to be able to find y prime, the graph of y prime of x from the graph of f of x. That's our number one goal here. Now, once we get a little experience with that, we'll go the other way as well we'll be able to look at the graph of the derivative and see what does that tell us about f. And then once we get a little practice with that, is what I'm saying, it just gets more and more complicated, then we'll be able to look at the function, this first derivative and a second derivative, and go back and forth between the three of them. But we got to get a good foundation first on looking at the graph of f and seeing what that tells us about f prime. So uh, I'm going to put... Uh, an x, y axis here, and I'm going to graph f of x in this green. And suppose we do something like that. So here is our graph of y equals f of x. And we are going to look for important identifiers in f prime. Okay? So first, what we want to look for is where could f prime be zero? So where is f prime equal to zero. Okay? So 
But what I want you to do, and what we're going to do with your uh, those highlighters and that worksheet eventually, I'm, let me give you some ideas here. So what I'm going to have you do is to mark up both of those. You're going to have a graph of F and you're going to have the graph of F prime. So what we do here, you can mark in one color on, on the function and how it manifests itself in the derivative. So we're going to see that where this thing has a, we'll call those a relative maximum and a relative minimum, a high point and a low point, as long as it's nice and curved and not where the derivative is undefined, that is going to be an x-intercept in the graph of the derivative. And so what you'll be doing with your marker is you'll pull out one color and you'll mark, you know, on the function graph, you'll mark this, something, you put a little smudge of one color there. And then on the derivative graph, you'll put that same smudge on where it crosses the x-axis so your brain can see those colors and know that they're connected. They go together. Then you'll pick a different color uh, and you'll say, where is the function increasing? So you'll look over here and say, well, it's increasing when it's rising from left to right. And so you'll do something like this. And then you'll go over to the graph of the derivative and uh, where f is increasing, f prime of x is going to be positive. And so you mark up that part of the derivative graph that's above the x-axis. Does that make sense? Yeah. You go ahead and do that first one with us so you can kind of see how that's going to look. Then you'll come back and you'll look at the graph and you'll say, okay, here you're going to see where the graph of the function f was decreasing. And so then where f is decreasing, f prime of x is going to be negative. And so you will mark up on your derivative graph the part that's below the x-axis. So we're trying to, to make that connection in your brain. Okay? Now, here's where it gets down to a little more sophisticated level. When you look at this graph now, it's kind of hard to tell, but the original graph is here. So somewhere in here, this thing changes from concave down to concave up. You with me there? So where it is concave down, our derivatives, if you look at those slopes of the tangent lines, you're going positive, zero, negative, they are decreasing. Okay, so all in this part here, where this is concave down, so where f is concave down, f prime of x is decreasing. It's going to be decreasing. So you'll mark with the same color, because like I've got blue, but you can do whatever color you got. So the part of the original function that is concave down will correspond to the part in the derivative graph where it's falling from left to right. Is that okay? And then likewise on this part here, well, I guess there's another part over here that I kind of missed, because somewhere in here, there's going to be another place where it changes from concave up to concave down. So there's another piece over here where it's going to be concave down. And so we should mark that also and find where the derivative would be decreasing. And then on the part where the, the original function, the original graph is concave up, you can see the slopes are going like negative, zero, positive. So they're getting bigger as you go from left to right. So where our original function is concave up, our derivative function is going to be increasing. And you can mark those up. Okay? Okay. Let me throw just a couple more out there. I don't think you're going to see any of the, these kind of more exotic things in your graph. But I want to talk about what we've talked about here a minute ago, vertical tangents and cusps. Because I will expect you to be able to do that, say, on a test. So if we have something like, I'm just going to put it over here. So we're going to have curve, and we have somewhere in here, there's going to be a vertical tangent. Okay, so this white curve is the f of x. And then I'm going to graph in green 
the f prime of x. So when you see a vertical tangent, then what's going to happen as that slope of the tangent line comes here is going to go to infinity. So there is going to be a vertical asymptote in the graph of the derivative at a vertical tangent. So you might say that this, now there's a little bit of a judgment call. That looks like it may be close to zero or just a little bit negative. That's your choice. So I'm going to say maybe um, it's not quite zero. So I'm going to say it looks like it's a little bit negative over here. So I'm going to start the graph over here below the x-axis. I'm graphing the derivative. And then it's going to go steeper and steeper and steeper to negative infinity. It's going to look like that. So there's the graph on the left side of that vertical tangent of the derivative. Does that make sense? I'm going to back up to the right and I'll say here, same thing. Mm, I don't know, judgment call. It's at zero, maybe not quite zero. I'm going to say uh, maybe not quite zero, just a little bit negative. So over here, I'm going to come from the negative. And then as we come in here, it's going to fall off the cliff and go really big negative. It's going to go to the same infinity on a vertical tangent. You with me? Okay. Change the game. I'll give you a cusp. So, uh, say over here, we're going to get, uh, let me do it from below. You haven't seen that. Let's go something like this. Here's a cusp. It's coming from below. Okay, there's the f of x in white again. And then again, graph f prime of x in green. Okay, so here looks like maybe uh, a little bit positive. Okay, so not a very big positive. I'm going to say, I'm going to start right in there. Then it's going to go steeper, 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 steeper until it goes through the roof. It's going to be a vertical asymptote, and it's going to go to positive infinity. I'm going to walk it over to the edge here. A little bit negative, so maybe a little bit below the x-axis. As I approach that cusp, it's going to go steeper, 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 and it's going to go to negative infinity. So cusp is going to give us a vertical asymptote where it goes to different infinities on each side. Okay? All right. Go mark up your worksheets. Have you done it already? Just Yeah, just uh, with the highlighter. What I want you to do is as many of those things as you can find. So mark it up on the function and, the, and it's how it looks on the derivative in the same color. So a relative maximum on the function will be an x-intercept on the derivative. Make them in the same color so your brain will associate those colors together. Where you see the original function increasing, mark that with some color, that whole part of the curve, and then mark that in the derivative where it's above the x-axis. So I'm going to stop the tape because I think we're going to have to work on this. And that's really about what I want to do.